So before we start talking about what's on the board, I just want to show you a picture. Uh, I know we talked about it in lab a little bit, but this is the optic nerve, and you can see in kind of yellow and black here, these are supposed to be axons. And these axons are coming from these various um, neurons that are found in the retina. So in this next picture, these <coughs> are the neurons that are found in the retina of the eye. So let's go over those, and then we'll go back to the uh, blind spot after I get another one of these cough drops. <coughs> Saving my voice. All right, so as you look at this picture, this is the pathway of light. So down in this area here to the right at the bottom is supposed to be like where the cornea is located. And light is going to come in, go through the pupil, go through the vitreous humor, and hit the retina. So this is the retina. Multiple different neurons in layers make up the retina. And then the light passes through and hits the pigmented layer and is absorbed there and disappears. Now you can kind of think of the pigmented layer as uh, a big braking system, okay? So light is just energy. That's all it is. Light is kinetic energy. It's what we would call photons. These are moving at the speed of light. They've got a lot of energy to them. If you could take a bunch of photons and squish them all together and throw that ball of photons at something, it would probably like, explode this wall. Uh, the government's trying to come up with like a photon beam cannon because it's so powerful. Like lasers, okay, that's all light squished together in one pinpoint beam, you get a lot of energy from that. So the pigmented layer, it absorbs energy. And you can kind of think of it like, let's say you've got an 18-wheeler going down the Cajon Pass and it loses its brakes. Now you've seen on the Cajon Pass these turnout lanes for these 18-wheelers, and there's this huge, gigantic mound of sand at the end of the turnout lane. What happens when this 18-wheeler hits that mound of sand? It slows it down, and it stops, right? Hopefully, so that it doesn't hit the mountain, right? So the whole idea is this 18-wheeler that's lost its brakes hits this turnout, hits that mound of sand, and the sand absorbs all of the energy to the point that the 18-wheeler completely stops. Same thing happens with the pigmented layer. When the light comes in and it moves through the retina, it will continue with all its kinetic energy all the way to the pigmented layer. And the light is like the 18-wheeler. The pigmented layer is the mound of sand. It will absorb that light until the light stops. And if kinetic energy stops, well, it's not kinetic energy anymore. It's gone. There is no more light. It disappears. Because you don't want it to bounce. You don't want it to create a problem. Now, as this light passes through the retina, the first group of neurons are called ganglion cells. However, light is not the ligand for this neuron. It does not stimulate this neuron. The light passes right by the ganglion cells, doesn't do anything. The next group of cells are called bipolar cells. These neurons also do not have light as their ligand. The light goes right on by the bipolar cells, nothing happens. But the next group of cells we've talked about are the rods and the cones. Now notice we call them rods because the dendrites have this kind of long rod looking shape to them. Reminds me of Marge Simpson's hair, but whatever. <laughs> the cones, of course, their dendrites actually look like a little cone, okay? And so this is why they've named them rods and cones. When the light comes in, it will stimulate either the rods or the cones. Now, how do we know which one it's going to stimulate? Well, rods, dim light, right? Okay, towards nighttime type of thing. Not very bright light. So, very weak light stimulates rods. The stronger, more bright light will stimulate cones. That's why we see color better in bright light and in the darker, dimmer light, we see the shades of gray. So this light comes in, goes right past the ganglion cells, goes right past the bipolar cells, and depending on how strong the light, 
will stimulate either a rod or a cone. Now, let's say the cone gets stimulated. Let's say it's real bright light. Once the cone is stimulated, once this light acts like the ligand, sodium gates are going to open and sodium is going to diffuse in and we're going to repel potassium down the neuron and this first cone is going to release a neurotransmitter to stimulate the bipolar cell. Ligand regulated gates will open, sodium diffuses in, repel potassium down the neuron and the bipolar cell will release a neurotransmitter that stimulates the ganglion cell. Same thing again, ligand gates open and we repel potassium down the ganglion cell. Now, rods and cones, they're kind of weird. They don't have any action potentials. Bipolar cells, they're weird too. They don't have any action potentials. The only ones that do are ganglion cells. And let's go back to this picture because all these axons here are coming only from the ganglion cells. So the axons of the ganglion cells are making up our optic nerve. And so the ganglion cells will send action potentials down the optic nerve to the occipital lobe of the brain so we can understand what we're seeing. And again, remember, because there are no rods and cones here where the ganglion cells are leaving the eye to make up the uh, optic nerve, we have a blind spot. Okay. Any questions about this so far? All right, so let's move on and we'll start talking a little bit about the picture that we have. And this is a different type of sketch of our rods and our cones here. And we're going to talk about the rods because, well, first of all, they're a little bit more simple and we don't know as much about how cones uh, react. So rods will be a little bit better. And so this is, <clears throat> excuse me, the phospholipid bilayer making up the dendrites of our rod. And in the phospholipid bilayer are integral proteins. So like I have in this first picture here, this is supposed to represent the phospholipid bilayer of the dendrites of the rod. And so we have a few very important integral proteins, okay? The first integral protein in red here is something we call opsin, and that's what you see in the overhead picture. This is opsin. Attached to opsin is another chemical, this is not a protein, this chemical is called 11-cis-retinol. And we'll talk about this later, but we actually get 11-cis-retinol from vitamin A. So if you don't have enough vitamin A, your rods don't work well and you have a night vision problem. Okay, so if your mom ever told you to eat your carrots because like rabbits don't eat, wear glasses, okay, this is why, because there's lots of vitamin A in your carrots. So you have to have vitamin A to make this chemical 11-cis-retinol. When it is attached to the opsin, we call this whole thing rhodopsin, okay? Another integral protein is called transducin. Our third integral protein right here is actually also an enzyme. This is called phosphodiesterase or just PDE. And the last integral protein is the ligand regulated gate. In this case, the ligand is actually going to be cyclic GMP. And we'll talk about how that works in just a minute. But in this overhead, this larger protein here, this is opsin. And in red here, they have it, this is 11 cis retinol. These two, when they're bonded together, make what we call rhodopsin. Now, 11 cis retinol attracts light. So if light is around, that light will actually go to and hit our 11 cis retinol. It has a high affinity for light. So if you look at this picture here, in purple here, this is our 11 cis retinol. This is the actual chemical structure and it is purple in color in reality and it also has this kind of bent shape to it. When 11 cis retinol attracts light, the kinetic energy of the light changes the chemical structure of 11 cis retinol to what we call all trans retinol. All trans retinol is a straight chain and the interesting thing is it actually goes from being purple to being clear. Okay, so you have something like this. This would be 
our 11 cis retinol. It's got this little bent shape to it. And if light strikes this, Eleven cis retinol will then become straight shape. Now it doesn't stay purple; it actually goes clear. So we go from eleven cis retinol to all trans retinol. And we go from this kind of bent purple shape to the straight clear shape. And sometimes you'll hear people refer to this whole process as bleaching. Because we've bleached the color right out of it. This bleaching chemical reaction is the slowest chemical reaction in the human body. It can take up to several seconds to occur where everything else is taking nanoseconds or milliseconds to occur in our body. And you know that too because bright light has to be added here. And what happens when you go from a dark room to really bright light? Yeah, your eyes have to take a second to adjust. And the adjustment is actually this chemical change here. Going from all trans retinol to, or excuse me, 11 cis retinol to all trans retinol. So what we have to do to make this change is we're adding light and the kinetic energy of light is able to make the change. Now, let me show you this picture here, just kind of going through the same thing. In the beginning, we get 11 cis retinol from vitamin A, and when it's darker, our 11 cis retinol is attached to our opsin. So what I can do here is 11 cis retinol is always attached to oxen. Okay? So in this case, we have 11 cis retinol with our oxen bonded to each other. We have at the top here the chemical rhodopsin. If you turn on the lights, we go through the bleaching process. We're going to have the kinetic energy of light hit our 11 cis retinol and turn it into all trans retinol down here at the bottom. But all trans retinol and opsin, they don't like each other. They cannot bond to each other anymore. And so what we see is our all trans retinol and our opsin here actually separate. And that's all occurring when you go from a dark room to bright light. Now what if you were to do the opposite? What if you were to go from outside, walk into a dark room, okay? You're going to go backwards. So we have some enzymes. There's a couple of them. I'm not going to ask you to memorize their names. But we have a few enzymes that will take our all trans retinol and convert it back into 11 cis. Now, 11 cis and opsin have a huge affinity for each other. So the opsin gets pulled back and will immediately bond to 11 cis. And this happens constantly every time you go from dark to bright, bright to dark. Any questions so far? Yeah. Why is it easier on your eyes when you close your eyes and then turn the lights on? Well, because you're already doing this. Because if I'm in a bright light, in a bright room, and I close my eyes, I've just darkened inside. No, but like if it's dark and then you close your eyes and then turn the lights back on. I don't know, they make us do that at work all the time. They turn the lights on. Close your eyes. Oh, well, yeah, that's simple. Because if you've closed your eyes and you turn the lights on, okay, the light's already getting through your eyes. Okay. It goes through your eyelids. So it's already slowly adjusting. And then it adjusts faster once you open your eyes. And it's the same thing. Like, let's say I'm going to go into a dark room. It's best for me to close my eyes before I go into that dark room. Because it helps me to adjust before I even step in there. Okay, so in this first picture here, this is what's going on in a darkened room, okay? 
you have the 11 cis retinol attached to the opsin. And then all of these proteins are separate and our ligand regulated gate is open. Okay? It's just 
Here's picture number one. Oh, okay. That blind comes in, and now here's what we have. All they did it was basically rip each other. No. Out the yes, it. exactly. And that's it. Okay. Cool. So all that happened was light came in, yep. changed it to all trans. These two guys separated. All right. It's the same rub. I mean, yes. One, yes. Okay. So if light wasn't here, this would be a rod in dim light. So 11 cis retinol and opsin are attached. We have rhodopsin. And in dim light, <clears throat> excuse me, transducin, PDE, ligand regulated gate, they're all separate from each other. But as soon as the light hits, we go to the second picture. Because the light has changed 11 cis retinol into all trans retinol. And opsin and all trans have separated from each other. So this picture is without bright light. This is the result of bright light hitting the 11 cis retinol. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's our next step, yes. So now, as soon as all trans and opsin separate from each other, transducin has a very high affinity for opsin when it's all alone. And so these two guys will bond. One more time, from the beginning. 11 cis retinol and opsin are bonded to each other in dim light. Everybody else is separate. Bring in bright light, which has an affinity for 11 cis retinol, and this is the outcome. 11 cis retinol will turn into all trans retinol, which separates from opsin. Because opsin's all by itself now. These two guys got a divorce, so opsin's on the town, you know, looking for a new one. And transducin is it. They have their high affinity for each other, and so they're going to bond. They're going to hook up. What causes the high affinity? I don't know. It's shape. Opsin has a little bit different shape now that it's separated from the retinol. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> that is a potent camper. <coughs> Clear your nostrils. Dr. Harvey, what's, yes. what's CGMP stands for? Ah, thank you. <laughs> Instead of adenosine monophosphate, this is guanosine monophosphate. Other, we go to the third picture because now we gotta have a threesome because phosphodiesterase has an, a high affinity for this opsin transducin complex. So once we find this opsin transducin complex bonding to each other, phosphodiesterase will attract it. And now here we have all three of them bonded together. So no attraction until. Uh until the two bond. Yes. So you have to have the opsin transducin complex before phosphodiesterase is attracted. So what happened to the sodium ions over there? It's gone. Nothing yet. They're still going through. Okay. Mm -hmm. We haven't done anything with the ligand regulated gate. Notice here, cyclic GMP is the ligand. The gate is still open. And sodium's diffusing through. The gate is still open. We're going to close the gate because we just turn on bright light in just a second. Okay, so one more time. In bright, or excuse me, in dim light. That's what we have here in the first picture. 11 cis retinol and opsin are bonded together, so we have rhodopsin, transducin, phosphodiesterase, all separate. And the ligand regulated gate with the cyclic GMP ligand is open. Sodium is still diffusing, which means our rod is on. It's sending information to the brain. But we bring in the bright light, and we immediately make changes. 
the like was attracted to the 11 cis retinol and changed it to all trans retinol, which can no longer bond to opsin, so they separate. Now, because opsin's on its own, it is now attracted to transducin. That affinity causes them to bond. As soon as you have this opsin transducin complex, now is attracted to phosphodiesterase. And so in this last picture, you have all three of them bonding. Now, why do we need them all to bond? Simple reason, it's how we turn on the enzyme. We have to turn on phosphodiesterase, activate that enzyme. So if we can get opsin and transducin both to bond to phosphodiesterase, that enzyme will turn on, it will be active. It does basically two things. First, it's going to pull cyclic GMP off the gate. And then second, it's going to change its shape. So if you remember, like cyclic AMP, cyclic GMP is a circular chemical. And all phosphodiesterase does is it cuts one of the bonds on the circle. When I cut one of the bonds on the circle, what will the shape become? Yeah, it's going to become a line. So we're going to take cyclic GMP and we're going to <coughs> kill me. And we're going to turn it into a straight line, <coughs> which is GMP. That is not the ligand. It cannot bind to the gate, and so the ligand regulated gate closes. And no more sodium, the rod is off. How does the light change the shape of 11 cis retinol? Just the kinetic energy breaks bonds. Mm -hmm. And then it forms into a different shape. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So you said that turns it off? Off. Anytime you close the light and regulate a gate, your neuron turns off. So this would make us perceive light or darkness? This would be for bright light. <coughs> and then it would just be the opposite. We'll talk about that in just a second. Yeah. Yeah. All right, one more time. We'll go through this. <clears throat> I hope. All right, so in dim light, you have 11 cis retinol bonded to opsin. We have our rhodopsin and all our other integral proteins separate from each other and our ligand regulated gate open, okay? But if we bring in bright light, we'll convert 11 cis retinol to all trans retinol, which then can't bind to opsin anymore. They separate. Opsin on its own has a high affinity to transducin, so these two bond to each other. And now we have this opsin transducin complex, which has a very high affinity for phosphodiesterase, so all three of them bond together. And the reason we do this is to turn on or activate the enzyme. And phosphodiesterase, first thing it does, pull cyclic GMP off the gate, and now our ligand regulated gate closes, and then convert it into GMP so it can't open that gate. And you just turned off your rod. Close the gate, turn off the rod because you don't need rods in bright light because you're using cones. Any questions? So pulling the CGMP will turn off the gate and then uh, turning it into GMP will prevent it from going back and binding, right? Exactly. Okay. Any other questions? That's probably a stupid question, but when you say in dim light, does that mean also no light? You know, rods don't work very well in absolutely zero light. You can't see anything in zero light. So they have to have a little bit of light. Okay. But dim light <coughs> is low kinetic energy light. You have to have a higher kinetic energy light to turn off a rod. So if you were in a dark room, though, it would still seem possible. 
Yes. All right, now let's turn it back on, okay? So first thing that happens is there's no light. So you're going to convert all trans retinol back to 11 cis when you have no light. Okay, so I should have put that here. So in low light or in dim light, we're going to have our all trans retinol go back to 11 cis. So if you look here, you would take this all trans retinol and convert it into 11 cis. That's the first step. Now, all trans, or excuse me, 11 cis retinol has a super high affinity for opsin. Okay? So what it's going to do is it's going to pull on this opsin. And what it does, it breaks all three of these guys apart. Okay? So, first thing that happens, we dim the lights, and all trans retinol goes back to 11 cis. 11 cis has super high affinity for the opsin, so it pulls the opsin, and opsin, transducin, phosphodiesterase all come apart. Now, the gate isn't open yet. We gotta get the ligand back. What we have to do is we have to convert GMP back to cyclic GMP. There is a second enzyme that converts GMP back to cyclic GMP. Okay, so to convert cyclic GMP to GMP, we use phosphodiesterase. But to do opposite, I'm not telling you the name of that enzyme you have to look it up. You have to find the name of the enzyme, and you're going to add that onto your Scantron on Thursday when you have your second exam, and I'll give you two extra credit points. So you find the name of the enzyme that converts GMP back to cyclic GMP. You can find it, you can do it. Okay, so one more time. We're going to turn down the lights and we're going to convert all trans by some enzymes back into 11 cis retinol. 11 cis retinol has a super high affinity for opsin, so it's going to pull on the opsin and separate all three of our proteins here. Then we're going to take that second enzyme you're going to look for and we're going to convert GMP back to cyclic GMP. And we're going to come back to this picture here. Now our gate is open, our integral proteins are separate, and 11 cis retinol and opsin are bonded to each other. And we're back into dim or low light. And our rod is on. Any questions? Okay, so now your exam is gonna be on Thursday. Okay, and you know for sure that you have the neuron essay, which is 50 points. You also will have a second essay, which is worth 25 points. That second essay could be, possibly, what we just went over today. And by the way, this entire process in your book is called photo transduction. Remember, we talked about transducers. This is taking light energy and turning it into neurological information the brain <clears throat> understands. So we call this phototransduction. So one of your possible essays is phototransduction. Your other possible essay will be the general adaptation syndrome. 